actually brought that to the help me with, so that was great. Anyway, thanks to him. He did the key needs the month, so. I'm going to try it without because my hands are going to be full before long. So. Okay, thank you. All right. If anybody's out in the front, just tell me to speak up and I'll continue to do that. Um, thank you. Thank you, Cricket. Uh, the, the first thing that I wanted to do is just you know, take a minute and uh, marvel at this facility and this building. The fact that this all came together is, is really, I think, incredibly special. Uh, I've known Cricket long enough to watch her chasing some version of this dream for a little while, set in on a few meetings on those kinds of things. 
shape like color has these sort of three aspects that you can't separate from it, but you can easily distinguish. So the first one is what we call, what we call the silhouette. And that's kind of like, here's a good little vocabulary of shapes. Is it a square, is it a circle, is it an amoeba, it's got little long skinny shapes, it's got a triangle. Those are shape, think of them as shape human beings. Those are the silhouettes. Now, obviously, <coughs> shape of a horse is a distinct shape. But think about it for a minute. There's the impression you get, you see the horse, you kind of get the impression of a full shape of the horse, the entirety of the horse. But if it's a sunny day, there's the sunny part of the horse, and then there's the shadow part of the horse. Now those are two distinct different shapes, and they each have their own color. So continue with shape, there's the silhouette, that's the basic shape of it. The next big thing to think about is the edge. So if you have a shape with a sharp edge, it's you can almost like think of it as something you could cut out with scissors. You're, you're going to easily know where the edge of the shape that is. However, this is the same shape with a very soft edge. So this is somebody who's walking towards you on the beach in the fog. And at first you just recognize it as a person, and then as they come closer and closer to you, the edges get more defined, you finally recognize it as so and so. Oh, that's my friend. Because there's finally enough information to know. So that's the edge. Usually in, in the world, as we're observing things, it's not all crisp. You have to have a lot of contrast to have a sharp edge. And again, just take a look at anything in this room and play with it for a minute and you'll see what I'm talking about. Uh, things in the periphery of your vision are usually soft edge. The thing you're staring at is sharper. High contrast are sharper. Low contrast are softer. So this is how we distinguish shapes. Uh, and the last one is a little more complicated and that's texture. So some things are very smooth and even. Some things are actually kind of pebbly. Think of like you're looking at a tree, which technically speaking is a lot of little tiny shape. But you experience the tree as a whole, but it's kind of like dappled. Uh, and that texture is a useful tool for our listening audience. So, so again, keeping these two ideas in mind, every time I want to, if I'm going to paint something to represent it visually, I have to break it down like that. And um, think about it. What's the shape I'm seeing? What color am I assigning to it? How do I mix it? so far I have a lot of school right there so anybody y'all with me to at least a reasonable degree yeah okay good because I just taught you how to see this is how artists see and you can kind of practice these like color shape analysis yourself and uh, see what it what it tells you it's kind of an interesting way to look at the world okay so gouache here we go um, again it's, it's a water-based paint it's mixed with Always dissolvable in water. One of the great advantages is you, you can kind of come back to it and uh, re wet it. And now I'm going to block your view to some extent here, but hopefully you'll start to see how it kind of dissolves. Whenever you're working outside and you're reading it, it's mm -hmm. 
Yes. So how does that affect the union? <coughs> it's very interesting because uh, on a rainy day, this stuff will stay moist indefinitely. You know, just because it's heated. So for some of you, my little spritzer there to keep it from drying out. If I'm out in the wind on a hot sunny day, breeze blowing, it's going to drive me crazy because this stuff gets pressed to me really fast. And that's why I use these disposable pads. Let me just rip the sheet off. To an extent, yeah. It's, uh, I usually start with white, which is not an unusual thing, and then you go through uh, light to dark, warm to cool. So, yellow, orange, uh, deeper orange, or red, uh, uh, reddish brown, and then on the cool side, black, ultramarine blue, a uh, uh, blue green, ultramarine blue, a very uh, purpley magenta, and, and a green. So there's a kind of an order to it. There's all kinds of different ways you can do it. This is, a, this is a product called Canson Art Board, and this is a good quality uh, uh, pastel papers, actually, which come tinted in its nice tone. I can get it gray, tan, white, uh, a variety of tones, and it gets glued down to a high quality rag board. So this is, this is a quite a tough board. You can really uh, you know, give this some abuse. It won't buckle and curl up on So this is exactly how I would start if I was uh, next to the pad.
always happiest when I'm <coughs> just doing it my way. So, uh, you know. Uh, but what I do like, I've started, I, I sort of like get people to give commissions as subjects by request. You know, sort of, so if somebody says, hey, would you come paint my farm? I'd like, be delighted to go paint your farm. And uh, we can even talk about, you know, how big you might like it to be, get some idea of price and all. But I'm, I'm basically going to paint that painting uh, the way I see it. So what I do, I have learned to do, and I really enjoy that, is, is there's so many distinctive uh, you know, kind of individuals out there of all kinds. And I like looking for those ones that really kind of represent the scene well. So I'm just just tentatively putting in some silhouettes of the tree line, just, just a few touches. It's best also to keep things uh, kind of more middle tone and go for your bolder accents later. So you'll see things looking a little uh, medium tone, a little flat. All right, so here's a problem. I started painting this stuff. At first I thought it was all about painting horses, and I finally realized that in fact the toughest thing to paint is a crowd. And you can't paint all the so you have to figure out how to kind of suggest it. So I'll show you a little approach to that here. So you think about think about that business of you know what what shapes am I seeing? You know it's, it's great to understand the theory that I just laid out for you, but the question is how do you know what shape to pay attention to? So I'm just I'm Set up a kind of a gray blue. And we're going to use it to kind of just begin to suggest the location of our crowd. So these are kind of like a simple silhouette that suggests So if you notice the jockeys here, they're in very bright sunlight. So the two things that are true, like I said, so here where the reaches are white, it's easy to see. See this dark shape here? That's the shadow, isn't it? It's their leg is bent going forward, so it's completely out of the sun. And if, if it wasn't for that, you wouldn't know that their leg was bent. The rest of it's almost a flat white shape. They're also in this rather bright, sunlit grass, they're all throwing a shadow down on the ground. So my, my little abbreviation here for the sake of getting something going is I'm going to use my same blue-gray and I'm going to put in a little quick representation here of, uh, I can't remember, I think it was Brett Owings writing for uh, Lucy Bullett at the time, Trout for Spring.
talk a few months ago for uh, Broaden, one of my parents or one of his, and they had a good show, a show of my work up. And we basically talked about all of this part, we call it theory part, we kind of entitled the talk Journey to See, so I was explaining to them, they all were now very familiar with the paintings in the show, and I was trying to give them some insight What's going on in here already? Yeah. I mean, feel free if anyone wants to come up and stick the nose in here if you can. So this is this is just a serviceable, we already have a, a recognizable scene because we have silhouettes. And the silhouettes in this case are at least an approximation of the cast shadow. So I mean, here's another some simple assignments here just to show you the power of the local color. Do you thin your paints with water? Yes. something on the easel and something and, in your... Well, this, these are two little uh, cups of wire that just can be to have a little bit more. Uh, if you're in the studio, I might have a nice big jug of wire really squish the brush out. But, you know, if you're working in the field, you have limited materials. So you want to keep that to a minimum. So you don't use a glaze or anything? No, this is all opaque, just shape to shape. It's all the simplest possible interpretation of change my mind at some point, I will simply put up another color over top of it, which is, again, one of the great advantages of gouache. If I really made a mess, I could take a damp rag and remove wow. some of it. If I really, really made a mess, I'll just grab a new panel, because, you know, it's just a piece of cardboard. So, uh, just start over. It's always better to just... Oh, no, no, none of that at all. So, yeah, I can, I can put this down and go get a sound side. My paints might dry out, and I have to, you know, reload those. But uh, that works. So, where uh, what are colors you have in mind? Where what are the colors are a little more challenging. <clears throat> they have the, the depending on what you're trying to do with them. But in the traditional. 
traditional method, you dampen the paper, and you definitely want to be uh, getting most of it done as that paper goes through its different stages. Why are you wearing gloves? Uh, it's just more convenient, you know, to wash up later. Plus, I, I, I like to get my hands in, and you'll, uh, you'll see how I clean my palate, just have a wet rag and then like wipe it. I, I, I could get away, some people don't bother, but Okay, so white is also a local color. The jockey breeches are white, so we're just going to put those in very simply. When you're in your studio, do you paint as fast as it's outside, or do you? I do. I, it's identical in the studio. I don't change anything. In fact, I, one of the things I've learned about this is the faster the better. And when you're when you're working on location from white, you're really really going. Oops. So I've kind of learned, and it sounds odd, but it's sort of like the faster I paint them, the better they come out. Because I make bolder abbreviations, and I think you're in the studio if you don't get this right. <laughs> That's right. So, so what I've done here, even though I'm using the uh, white to represent the local color of the object, like it's a white breeches, in this case a white, uh, you know, white uh, silks, we're going to put spots on them, but I'm, I'm treating it very flatly, but you notice I'm not putting anything in the shadow. So that leg movement forward that we we're talking about has already been represented in my first go, where I put in the full silhouette, albeit very loosely. And then I've left that alone. So you have already get a little bit of sense of things moving in the light, moving through space. Very, very elementary. Uh, so let's let's take something. All right, so here we have the, the reds, a good opportunity to do that. We have the reds of the Armada colors there. And now I'm going to make a lighter red and kind of put in what I would call a top light. So this is like where the sun is 
hitting the shoulder. There's a highlight on the hat. There's a little highlight on the shoulder. That tone will darken a little bit in a second. But just ever so slightly, it gets a little bit of dimension. Same thing on remember the helmet. We're going to put that in a nice blue. So I, I painted that in a kind of a middle blue. It's like a little bit darker, richer blue, and kind of give it the, the shadow sign. So we know the sh shadows are going that direction, so the sun is falling this way. That means my shadows are going to be on that side, and the highlights are going to be on the other. So we'll have a little tint of lighter, lighter blue there. So again, again, super abbreviated term. That helmet is now starting to have a little volume to it. We see the sun hitting the top, turning the corner, and going into the shade. So, so let's take um, let's take this uh, the jockey's uh, shirt here, and we're going to put in some shadow. So I see the the wrist is, is going forward, so that's that's a little bit in the shadow. There's a few little folds in the shirt. watercolor brushes? I do. In this case, I am using watercolor brushes. These are synthetics, not nothing fancy like a stable. I'm just using uh, you, can, you can buy these synthetic bristles.
more vi vibrancy of pain than the photograph. It, it, that's the point of the whole thing. Oh, and that was another great thing I got from a security guard at the big T. He came over and was looking for a minute and goes like, these are good pieces. I was like, taking a picture, but better. <laughs> Why do you like it better than acrylics? Uh, because acrylics can't be moved around. So um, we just uh, noted from a question that it's almost always uh, you're painting wet on dry. The paint dries like that. However, because of the nature of the gum arabic, it re-wets so easily. When you put that stroke down, it does in effect re-dissolve right into the paint. So you can get some effects that look like oils wet on wet. And if I want to soften an edge. Let's just say, for example, here's a perfect example. So we have this transition here. Here's a here's a drawer bending over this this part of the thigh is moving forward is consequently in the shade, right? And we can see that there's a nice soft transition around his buttock there. And this is kind of a, just a sharp edge. Back to our, our shape theory. Sharp edge versus soft. So if I take a damp brush, that edge. And now it just bends back nicely. So you can do that with acrylic. What? You can't do acrylic. You'd have to mix all those tones together. Because they're done. They're they're all they're they're gone dry. It's impossible to re-dissolve. And that little maneuver there in oil painting, like if you look at money, he'll do a lot of very vigorous direct brush work. He's not fussing with anything.
where you have these two big sticky nests. It's like a pile of butter. So then you just pick up a pallet knife and you scrape it off. So it, it reduces the, all that material is now out of your way and you can work right back into it. So somebody like John Sargent, if he didn't like his painting, if he didn't like where it was going, he thought it had lost its way and the structure was poor, he would scrape it and fog it. So what that means is you get the excess paint off it. And I'm not talking about a little, you know, lose on He just scraped the whole thing down. <laughs> Put it on, you know, scrape that off, and then he'd take a big brush and he'd just fog it out. Now, canvas, the weave of the canvas will hold a lot of that paint, even though you've taken the excess off. So you haven't really entirely lost the image. So if you think, of course, the mass of the light base against the dark background will also be there. It's just this nice, soft, blurry, uh, you know, hint of it. And, and it, oh, the paint's not very, very thin. So he could either continue immediately that's enough, you know, for today, count this so-and-so, you know, once you come back next week, and he just put that one against the wall, uh, and then we'd begin again. So he, his paintings are not so much a incremental process of correction of things he doesn't like, they're a rehearsal for the next time when he's going to do it all in one go, but this time it's going to be better. So in gouache, there's really not much point in knocking it all back down again, it's, it's such a quick if I don't like it, I'll just simply paint another one, usually. In, in oils, I follow Sargent's method, which is I mostly take it down if I just really, really hate it. But if it's looking good, and it's building, and it's a complicated piece, uh, I might gently shave off some excess paint and let it sit and come back to it a couple days later and continue. So it's the same build-up process, it's just I have new collections. And that's really necessary. walk away from this painting and come back in two weeks and finish it. I could, I absolutely could. I will, I will or want to, but not in the first story. So did you initially start painting in your in the early years? <coughs> oh, very early. Very early. I mean, when I was a, a, a child, you know, six, seven, eight years old, I was already, already always drawing all the time. I lived overseas with my parents were missionaries in South Korea. So when I showed interest in art, the first thing that was available was uh, Asian brush painting. So I learned this whole technique of you know painting like bamboo and irises and all that kind of thing. It was, it was a sort of tremendous education. It really was a wonderful place to start. And I've, I've held on to that. Uh, a lot of painters prefer to use uh, very different That's far enough to get the point across. Um, come on up and have a look. Any questions?